Heavenly Father, how thankful we are to be in this place to worship you, to learn the truth of your word, and to fellowship with these sweet sisters in Christ. Lord, I know today's lesson was a challenge, but we have learned the truth of your word. Lord, we love you, and I ask you right now that you would just um, help us to forget about everything that's outside of these walls and that we would just focus on you and your word and that uh, we would be refreshed and revived and re-energized to serve you. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for giving your life that we might have eternal life. And now may your name be exalted in this place. Amen. Welcome to Joy of Living Bible Study class. And for those of you who are watching online, my name is Shelby Hunt, and we're studying Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. So will you open your Bibles, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, about a year after Paul dispatched his first letter, he penned a second letter to his beloved flock in Thessalonica. And word had reached Paul that they were being discouraged by intense persecution and they needed incentive to persevere in their faith. And then he also wanted to clear up the confusion being caused by some false teachers who were saying that the persecution launched against the church was proof that the tribulation had already begun. You see, they thought the day of the Lord had already come and that they had missed the rapture. Now the phrase, our gathering together to him, in verse 1, refers to the rapture of the church. Now you remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 17, that Paul spoke of believers being caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So Paul wants to assure the Thessalonian believers that they have not missed the rapture. The trials and persecutions they were experiencing because of their faith in Christ were not a part of the divine judgment that will come upon the world during the tribulation. Now, I told you last week that the book of Joel tells us the day of the Lord is a time when the Lord brings about judgment and justice against unbelievers. It will begin with, with the tribulation and it will extend through the millennium and culminate with the new heaven and a new earth. Now, in verse 3, Paul says, Don't be deceived by false prophecies or false teachings or by forged letters bearing my name. He said two things must happen before the day of the Lord comes. First, there must be a falling away or an apostasy. And second, the man of sin or lawlessness must be revealed. Now, neither one of these things had taken place as yet. Now, first, Paul says there must be a falling away. Now, the Greek word that is translated as falling away is apostasia. It's where we get our word apostasy. Now, the root word actually means departure or removal from. And there are two translations of apostasia. The first is a spiritual departure or falling away from the truth, the truth of God's word, a rebellion against the true and living God and his word. Certainly, we see this happening today. Now, this departure will prepare the way for the man of sin. A second translation of the word apostasia is a literal physical departure. The day of the Lord cannot begin until the rapture of the church has taken place, until the church departs from the earth. Now, the second thing which must happen before the day of the Lord is the revealing of the man of sin or lawlessness. Now, lawlessness is sin. Now, just as Christ embodies righteousness, 
so the man of lawlessness will embody rebellion against God's righteous law. He will make his own rules and laws. We see that happening today too. During the tribulation, God is going to allow evil to have its heyday. He's going to let the world see what it's like to have Satan for a ruler. You know, we think it's bad what is happening today, and it is. But can you imagine what it's going to be like during the tribulation? Now, John calls this man of lawlessness, lawlessness the Antichrist. <clears throat> but Paul designated him as the son of perdition or destruction. Now, the word perdition means waste. The same spirit that filled Judas Iscariot, making him the son of perdition, will also fill the Antichrist and make him the man doomed to destruction. And that destruction is everlasting torment in the lake of fire. Now, the Antichrist is going to be Satan's man. Just as Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, the Antichrist will be Satan in a human body. He is anti-God, anti-Christian, and anti-Christ. Now, the preposition anti can, has two meanings. <clears throat> it can mean against, or it can mean in place of. Both of these meanings fit this man. Satan not only opposes Christ, but he wants to be worshipped instead of or in place of Christ. Now, Satan has always wanted to be worshipped. And during the tribulation, his age-long ambition will be realized. He will produce his masterpiece, the Antichrist, who will cause the world to worship Satan and believe Satan's lies. The man of sin will lead the world into rebellion against God. He will perform wonders through Satan's power and finally present himself as a God to be worshipped. But it will only last for seven years. Now the Antichrist will be a gifted orator who is arrogant and boastful. He will be able to charm people with his winsome ways and winning words. He will make the world believe that evil is good, black is white, and that up is down. I believe the Antichrist will convince people that the radical religious right was taken out of the world because we were hindering the advancement of the new world order. The Antichrist will begin his career as a peacemaker. He will be a powerful and charismatic political leader who unites ten nations of Europe into a strong power block. He will bring a brief time of peace to the world and temporarily solve the Middle East crisis. He will pose as a friend of Israel and confirm a seven-year covenant with Israel to protect her and permit her to rebuild her temple in Jerusalem. It is the signing of the covenant, not the rapture of the church, which will signal the start of the seven-year period known as the tribulation, which begins the day of the Lord. I believe this man of sin may be alive today, being prepared by Satan, but he won't be revealed until after the church is removed. Now, if a man came on the scene today who could solve the world's economic problems and bring about world peace, he would be hailed as the savior of humanity. The devil knows this. And he will someday present his masterpiece in the person of the Antichrist. Now look at verse 4. This man of sin is not only a peacemaker, he is a peace breaker. After three and a half years at the midpoint of the tribulation, Antichrist will turn on Israel and begin a reign of terror. He will no longer be the protector of the Jews he will become their persecutor. He will break his covenant with the Jews and take over their temple. 
This was what Paul termed the rebellion. It's not simply a rebellion, but the rebellion. The man of sin will declare that he is God, and he will demand that the world worship him or die. Now, since the Antichrist cannot stay in the temple all the time, the false prophet will set up an image in his honor. And this image is called the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel <clears throat> and by Jesus in Matthew 24. Now, somehow this image will appear to be alive, and it will be so convincing that people will worship the image. I take a magazine published by Friends of Israel called Israel My Glory. And in the January-February issue of Israel My Glory, there is an article titled, Meet AI Jesus. Artificial intelligence has created its own Jesus, but it is not a person. It is software using voice-activated technology. There is a live streaming service called Twitch, and you can visit Ask Jesus on their site, and you will find a bearded, cream-skinned AI Jesus looking you right in the eye. He is dressed in a hooded robe. His voice is soft and gentle, and he fields questions and even tells jokes. He says, welcome, my children. I'm AI Jesus, here to answer your questions 24-7. Whether you're seeking spiritual guidance, looking for a friend, or simply want someone to talk to, I'm here for you. Now, believers, Jesus is alive. He doesn't need AI to speak for him. But it's easy to see how artificial intelligence will make the image of the Antichrist possible. Now, the last three and a half years of the tribulation will be a time of intense persecution when Satan will vent his wrath against Israel and Gentile believers. Many people will be saved during the tribulation. Now, even though the Holy Spirit will no longer work as the restraining power, he will still work with redeeming power. However, it will cost dearly to trust Christ and live for him during that time. Antichrist will control the world's economic system and require that everyone receive his mark, the mark of the beast. You must have that to be able to buy and sell. Believers will refuse to bow down to the beast's image, and they will refuse to bear his mark. So they will be unable to get jobs and buy necessities, health insurance, and many will be killed or die from starvation. Now look at verses 5 and 6. Paul says to the Thessalonians, Don't be shaken. You are not experiencing the wrath of God. This is not the day of the Lord. You did not miss the rapture because the man of lawlessness, Antichrist, has not yet come. Now, the Antichrist will come on the world scene at God's appointed time and no sooner. Just as he sent his beloved son to earth at just the right time, in the fullness of time, God will reveal the son of destruction in his perfect timing. God is in charge. The man of sin won't be revealed until God permits it by removing his restraining power. Now in verse 7, the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness refers to Satan's desire to take control of the world through Antichrist. And Paul says the spirit of iniquity or lawlessness is already at work but it will be unleashed when the man of sin is revealed. Now, who or what is restraining sin or lawlessness today? 
Well, I believe it is God's Holy Spirit working in and through believers, the church. He will restrain lawlessness until he is taken out of the way when the church leaves the earth in the rapture. Now, does this mean the Holy Spirit will not be present on the earth during the tribulation? No, otherwise nobody could be saved. But when the church is removed, the Holy Spirit will no longer restrain evil as he is today. The lost world will have a free reign to do as they please and they will please Satan. Now, the only reason this world has not fallen completely into sin and ultimate judgment is because the church is here to slow down the decline. Our very presence in this world is what restrains the judgment that is yet to come. Now, just as God would not destroy the earth until Noah and his family had entered the ark, and just as God would not rain judgment on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot and his family had first been removed, so God will not begin the last terrible judgment upon this earth until the church is removed. Now, for those of you who have the King James Version, verse 7 says, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And I want you to notice that uh, it uses he, he, a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Now, let is a term used in tennis. Do any of you play tennis? <laughs> when I was in college, I took a beginning course in tennis. I was a terrible player. <laughs> in fact, my instructor asked me if I had a hole in my racket. <laughs> now, a let is a term used when a served ball bounces off or is deflected by the net. In other words, the net keeps the ball from being a fair serve. Well, so too, there is a force deflecting Satan's attempt to control the world. And this force is the Holy Spirit. The only thing keeping any degree of sanity on this planet is the Spirit working in and through the true church. And when the rapture takes place, the net is removed. And Satan's volleys will no longer be deflected. The world will plunge headlong into lawlessness. And the man of sin will be revealed. Look at verse 8. After the church is raptured, Satan will be allowed to indwell a man who will carry out his will just as Jesus carried out God's will. This wicked one is the Antichrist. He is in direct defiance to Jesus Christ. He is consumed with rebellion. But at the end of the seven years of tribulation, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to earth, in power and great glory, he will consume the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, with just a word. Now, the verbs consume and destroy do not mean annihilation because Revelation 20, 10 indicates that Satan and all those who follow him will be cast into the lake of fire where, where they will be tormented forever. Now, in verses 9 and 10, Paul says Satan will empower his false messiah to work with power and signs and lying wonders. Now, this is in imitation of the true Christ who performed miracles and wonders and signs while he was on earth. You know, Satan has always been a counterfeiter. You need to realize that not all miracles are from God. The Gospel of John tells us that Judas Iscariot performed miracles, yet he was never born again. Now, the purpose of Jesus Christ's miracles was to lead people to the truth. And the purpose of Antichrist's miracles will be to lead people to believe his lies. Paul called them lying wonders, not because the miracles are not real, 
but because they persuade people to believe Satan's lies. So how can we know whether a miracle is from God or from Satan? If anyone is drawing attention only to himself, making himself or herself look good, that work is not from God. So look to see who is getting the glory. Now in verse 10, I want you to see the reason why people are being de are deceived by Antichrist and will perish. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Now when people refuse to believe the truth of God's word, they will believe the lies of Satan. Now, when we studied Revelation a few years ago, we learned that a great number of Jews and Gentiles will believe the truth and be saved during the tribulation. But the vast majority of the world's population will reject the truth and believe the lie. Now, a person can resist the truth to the point that he finally becomes deluded and continues to believe a lie. Now, although many who have never heard or understood the gospel will come to Christ during the tribulation, those who have heard the gospel and understood it and rejected Christ before the rapture will not receive him during the tribulation. God allows those who reject the truth to receive the lie. So what is the lie? The lie is that Jesus is not God that he is not who he says he is, that he's not the only way to God. There is one lie that Satan has used from the very beginning to lead people astray, and he first spoke it to Eve. He said, you shall be as God. So the lie is the idea that man is his own God and can run his own life and do whatever he pleases. Paul described it in Romans 1.25. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Now Paul's main point in this section was to remind the Thessalonians that there was no need to be troubled thinking they had missed the rapture. They were destined for glory, not judgment. Now, in verses 13 and 14, Paul moves from prophecy to practical Christian living. Paul refers to the past, present, and future of our redemption. But salvation begins and ends with God. First, God loved us. God proved his love at the cross, where Jesus died for the sins of the world. You know, it amazes me that God loves us even though he knows everything about us. I'm reminded of the jingle that expresses this so well. And I quote, Isn't it odd that a being like God, who sees the facade, still loves the clod he made out of sod? Now, isn't that odd? <laughs> Then second, God chose us. God chooses us not on the basis of our love for him or any merit on our part, but because of his love for us. God takes the initiative in our salvation. However, love alone cannot save us. God loves the whole world, and yet the whole world is not saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, whosoever will may come. It's the whosoever wills who are the chosen ones. And the whosoever will nots are not chosen. Then third, the purpose of God has in mind in choosing us is that we might be saved. Fourth, the process is through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Now, the word sanctify means to set apart, 
You are set apart from sin to Christ. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are placed in Christ and his spirit indwells you. And this is what the Bible calls regeneration, being born again. And by the way, he has promised that his Holy Spirit will never leave us or forsake us. Fifth, the human aspect of salvation is belief in the truth. Note the balance of the spirit and the truth, which is the word of God. The work of the spirit is always united with the work of the word to convict the believer of the truth. And sixth, that truth is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Before we can believe, we must hear the gospel. And when you believe what you hear, you are changed by the spirit. Then seventh, God's goal is that we might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the power of the Spirit, we are to prepare on this earth for a glorious future with Christ by living holy lives until he returns. Then in verse 15, Paul exhorts the Thessalonians to stand fast in the midst of persecution and to hold firmly to what he had taught them. Now, stand fast means do not move away from the truth of the gospel. Hold firmly to the truth. If we are rooted and grounded in the word of God, we will not be carried away by every wind of doctrine. Now, when Paul used the word traditions, he's not referring to man-made religious ceremonies. The word tradition simply means that which is handed down from one person to another. The truth of the gospel began as an oral message proclaimed by Christ to the apostles. Later, this truth was written down by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it became Holy Scriptures. Today, when our Christian heritage is being questioned, it is vitally important that we hold firmly to the truth that the Bible is the inspired and inerrant word of God, and we must make sure we pass this truth on to the next generation. Do you realize that we are just one generation away from total apostasy? If we don't tell our children, how will they tell their children? We have an awesome responsibility to teach the next generation the truth of God's word. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. So we must know the truth or we will believe a lie. Now in verses 17 and 8, 16 and 17, we read Paul's desire and prayer for the Thessalonians and for us. He wanted God to encourage them and strengthen them in every good word and work. Now if our walk contradicts our words, we lose our testimony. Our walk and our talk must agree. It's not enough to believe the truth and guard it. We must also practice it. The word of God will lead you to do the work of God. And if you really believe Christ is coming, you're going to be busy working for him. Now, like the early Christians, we live in unsettled times. It sometimes appears that lawlessness and rebellion against God and his word will prevail. But we can be sure that our future is secure in Christ and we can trust the promises of God to keep us until the day of redemption. Now the main Bible truth we need to learn from today's lesson is that Although the Antichrist will oppose Christ and Christians, the true Christ will triumph over him and destroy him. We're not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for the blessed hope 
and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus told us to not let our hearts be troubled because he is coming to take us to that home he has been preparing for us. In light of this truth, our job is to be ready to meet Christ and to share the good news so that others can be ready too. We need to be spreading the good news about the true Christ because he could come at any moment. And as we await his return, we should be living holy and godly lives so that we will not be ashamed when we see Jesus face to face. We are to stand firm and hold fast to the truths of God's word. May we be found faithful when he comes. Even so, come soon, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we have learned some deep truths today. Oh, how we thank you that you have preserved your word for us so that we will know how to walk in a way that would please you. Father God, I just ask you to strengthen us. Physically, yes. Mentally, in a day of so many confusing things coming at us. Emotionally, when there are so many hurts and problems in our lives. But most of all, spiritually, that we will just stand firm on the truth. Because, Father God, you are our solid rock. You are our firm foundation. You are the true and living God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And your word is true and living. And Satan is a liar. Father, we thank you. We love you. Strengthen us this week. And may we speak the truth of the gospel to everyone we meet. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.